I'm going to lay out the case against Druckmann in three parts. Part one, lead up to the game. Part two, the game itself. And part three, what happened after the game's release and a conspiracy theory I've gone back and forth on. You're a righteous fiend, aren't you? In 2009, Bruce Straley and Legacy of Kane writer Amy Hennig directed Uncharted 2, with Neil Druckmann being one of the writers. Uncharted 3 came out in 2011, directed by Hennig, with Justin Richmond, and written by Amy. Next is The Last of Us, directed by Bruce and Neil, with Druckmann doing the writing. No, 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 Joel can die. Joel can die. Joel can die. However, while making Uncharted 4, shit went sideways, Amy and Justin left Disobedient K-9, and Druckmann slash Straley took over the game. IGN would report that sources told them it was a hostile takeover, but years later, Mitch Dyer, the man who originally reported it, now says he was forced to report it and those were baseless claims, four days after The Last of Us 2 releases. However, director of The Grey and Smoke and Aces, Joe Carnahan, called Neil a hitchhiker when Joe was writing the Uncharted movie, with the choice quotes being, the guy that kind of stole credit for it, referring to Cuckman, and there was a bit of saboteuring going on there at Naughty Dog. In contrast, regarding Henning, Joe said, Amy created that world, and she was the one that I really wanted to please. It is unlikely we will ever know exactly what happened since I got Henning to sign an NDA, and perhaps they got Richmond to do the same. After Uncharted 4, Bruce Straley would also leave the company, leaving Druckmann as the only remaining member of the Big Three. Next, the Neil reveal. What? No. Oh. Last of Us. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. The music is so last of us. Yeah, it's last of yeah. Oh care. my god, dude. Don't, oh, oh my god, dude, it is! The Fireflies! <laughs> what? In 2018, Druckmann would say Ellie was the only playable character in The Last of Us Part 2. In March 2020, Jason Schreier wrote an article about Naughty Dog's crunching habits, stating that 70% of the non lead designers that worked on Uncharted 4 had left the studio. He also stated that a pipe almost fell on some employees. In April, everything changed when Leak Nation attacked. There's no fucking way that's real. The game went from one of the most widely anticipated titles to one of the most mocked overnight. Bigot sandwich. Troy Baker, the voice actor for Joel, made a video downplaying the leaks. I don't get you, man. Or girl. I say man in a very non-gender specific way. Naughty Dog began abusing the copyright system, even striking one guy who didn't show any footage. Like I saw when it hit YouTube. And we're just all panicking, texting each other for them to take it down. And Neil posted a Kurt Cobain quote about bigots. While marketing the game, Naughty Dog had Ellie perform a singer's version of the song True Faith off her album Stolen without crediting her. One trailer switches the younger model of Joel for the older one to trick people into thinking he would be more prominent in the game. Another one released in 2019 switches Jesse's character model for Joel's. And Joel says Jesse's line. It rubbed me the wrong way right off the golf club, but I didn't realize how fucked it was until I saw people reacting to the lie. <laughs> On May 7th, Naughty Dog confirmed that you do not have to kill any dogs in the game after people said they didn't want to. You might think this gameplay footage of Ellie killing a dog in an unavoidable cutscene contradicts that, but you guys are just being mean. On June 12th, journal number 357 would tweet that Last of Us Part 2 was a masterpiece and compared it to Schindler's List. A few people brought up the Holocaust, which is apparently a game for Dreamcast, so if anyone wants a Holocaust review, please let me know. Jason Schreier responded to the Schindler tweet by saying that the audio logs from Bioshock were like the diary of Anne Frank. Neil got upset by this joke and said, we can do better with critical discourse, which I initially misread as critical intercourse. Jason replied, sure hope this has nothing to do with my reporting on your studio, haha. <laughs> Then the new God of War director jumped in to defend Neil, saying, I get that your bread and butter is tearing us down, but not everything is about your book or articles. Sometimes it is just about being decent to each other. Heart. And I have to say this is probably the most passive-aggressive tweet of all time. It's especially bad considering Jason tearing them down was him reporting that a pipe almost fell on a worker and the employees are exhausted. It pains me to defend Jason, censor your chat, Schreier, but Neil is so humorless I can't help it. Reviews came out, pretty much every mainstream outlet gave it a high score, but Skillup said he didn't like it. The game finally dropped on the 19th, and former president and idiot that reviews movies downloaded it. You don't want to be like this. This is disgusting. This is awful in every way. If I could kill it, I would. But I legally can't. But I've considered it. Joel's death scene is probably one of the worst in video gamer history. 
Well, one of a kind devs here, guys. Let's do something absolutely fucking retarded. In the first game, Joel spotted an ambush immediately, and when Henry and Sam had Joel in a position to shoot him and didn't, he still questioned them. Even if Abby had saved Joel instead of Joel saving Abby, that still wouldn't be enough for Joel to fully trust her. One could make the weak argument that Joel got soft over time, but in the flashback scenes, he was still wrecking shop. I think Drugman was so focused on making Joel's death hurt as much as possible that he forgot that it needed to make sense. It's not that I would want this, but if inflicting the maximum amount of pain on the player was the goal, he should have had us control Abby and made us torture him. There is a possibility that Neil still could have recovered at this point if he hadn't made the dumb decision to try to get us to empathize with Abby and simply let us play as Ellie. The way I see it, you can have Abby kill Joel in the most hateful way possible and then we kill her. Or you can have Abby kill Joel due to a misunderstanding or deeply regret what she did and try to make amends for it and maybe we can forgive her. But you can't do both. As it stands, the Abby that we got is an asshole and not at all swayed by Joel saving her fucking life. She never thinks, maybe I should at least talk to this guy about why he did what he did. There seems to be more to him. Instead, she says his name like she's talking to fucking Lord Voldemort and murders him. Manny spits on him, but we're supposed to forgive him because he fucks girls. At one point he says, I want to go watch anime or something like that and it took me completely out of the scene. It made The Last of Us feel like a generic Netflix fantasy movie where people still talk like it's 2020 America. To return to the Tiger Woods scene, we cut away too early and skip too much time so some of the impact is lost. We don't get Tommy's initial reaction and we miss out on most of Ellie's reaction as well. This continues throughout the game. Manny dies and Abby really doesn't have a reaction. Ellie tortures Noir, but the game cuts away from it. I have to wonder what would happen if you gave this big of a budget to the Spec Ops team and let them go wild. But reluctantly returning to this game, Nora taunted Ellie about Joel's death, so I'm not sure why I would feel bad for her, especially when I didn't get to see the torture scene. In fact, every other member of the WLF Ellie kills in a cutscene tries to kill her first, so I was always on Ellie's side. I mean, why would I not be? Her response to killing Owen and a pregnant male even though it was self-defense, is to enter into a state of shock, even though they were trying to kill her. The same cannot be said for Abby, who exhibits no regret and no remorse. Mel is freaked out by what Abby did, and Mel, who did nothing, had to pay the price for it. So the idea that Ellie and Abby are equally bad, and revenge is bad, and bigot sandwich, and we're supposed to be torn between the two, is fucking retarded. The only person Ellie kills in cold blood is a random Rattler member that had nothing to do with anything and it didn't make any sense. What the fuck, Ellie? Why? I'd also like to say that the Rattlers come out of nowhere. We don't get a backstory for them. I don't even know what they want or who their leader is. The WLF isn't much better since we get one scene with Isaac, then he dies. I would have enjoyed it a lot more if Isaac was like a surrogate father to Abby and was very prominent in the game. Then his death scene could have been the all is lost point. And maybe, just maybe, I would have felt bad for Abby. Well, maybe I shouldn't go that far. But the relationship I proposed could give her a window into what Ellie was going through and they could actually talk at the end of the game. You know, speak to each other at the climax of the fucking story. Abby could apologize to Ellie and tell her that she could never undo what she did and she would understand if Ellie wanted to kill her. Then if Ellie let her go, it would be more palatable. As it stands, it's unbearably unsatisfying. According to Mr. Druckmann, throughout 50% of the development, Ellie does kill Abby at the end, then they decided to change it. I have no idea why they made that change and it was a very bad choice. I think Neil was fine while working with Bruce and Amy because they kept him from going off the rails. But without them, he seems to have second-guessed himself to death. And if he wasn't so set on blaming other people for his game being made fun of, I'd feel bad for him. I have no proof of this, but I wouldn't be surprised if halfway through development, he decided to add the whole, look, these WLF people are people too, angle as well, because it feels very half-assed. Back to shitting on Abby, there's a scene where she finds out Dina, the girl she is about to kill, is pregnant, and replies, good. Dina herself is a very lackluster character whose only personality trait is making jokes. Ellie and her have already kissed, and it's clear that they like each other when we start playing as Ellie, so there's no lead up or tension in their relationship in my opinion. It is cool to see a lesbian relationship in a video game, since the only other canon lesbian I can think of is 16D from Nier. However, this relationship has no depth to it, and if you're going to make the lesbian relationship a selling point of the game, getting that relationship right should have been a priority. If Dina and Ellie's bond was as deep as Ellie and Joel's, even though it's more than a bit different, I don't know that as many people would be complaining. What are you so afraid of? 
that I'm going to end up like Sam. I can't get infected. I can take care of myself. How many close calls have we had? Well, we seem to be doing all right so far. And now you'll be doing even better with Tommy. <sighs> Not her, you know. What? Maria told me about Sarah. Ellie? And... You are treading on some mighty thin ice here. I'm sorry about your daughter, Joel, but I have lost people too. You have no idea what loss is. Everyone I have cared for has either died or left me. Everyone fucking except for you. So don't tell me that I would be safer with someone else because the truth is I would just be more scared. I'm also in a state of disbelief as to why Ellie would tell Dina about her immunity so casually and so early in the game. If she's that loose-lipped about it, I would reckon that her ex-girlfriend who would never get to meet knew and have the settlement knew as well. And now that I've typed that, I just realized Ellie's immunity played little to no part in the Last of Us sequel. Nora mentions it, Ellie gets bitten again, big whoop, but you could easily remove a couple of scenes and Ellie could have been anyone. Ellie really doesn't feel that special anymore. And that sucks. Returning to the previous bizarre conversation, Dina didn't believe it, but it still made me think that Ellie had turned into a dumbass between part one and part two. Dina trying to rescue Ellie, then falling through the roof is fucking hilarious, though. Dina! <laughs> Jesse is okay, but not memorable. Owen is likable enough, but I think his art got mishandled. It's revealed that he may have killed this guy named Danny. Abby and the others react as if this is an important character. The first time through, I thought I missed something, but I googled it and Google doesn't know who Danny is either, so there's no emotional weight to that revelation. Maybe telling us who Danny is before he dies would have been more important than throwing snowballs at children. We already know Owen will die when all this is happening, so the question of did he kill this unknown person, did he not, why did he do it, what will happen to him, isn't interesting at all. There's a throwaway line about how his family was killed, and if I remember correctly, that's all we get in terms of backstory. There's also a character in the game named Lev, who is trans, and I think that's his only personality trait. The bits with him and his sister feel like a side quest that goes on for too long, and I feel like it would be extremely interesting to play his love for a while. We could have him be a respected warrior amongst the scars, then he comes out as trans. Some people say it's okay, other people say it's okay but he should keep it on the DL, and others say that it's dumb altogether. Ultimately, the people that don't like him tell leadership, and he gets thrown out of the group. And I think playing as him during all that would be a perspective we've never gotten before in a video game. If Juckman's goal is to foster sympathy for trans people, then I think it'd be the appropriate path to go down. As it is, it strikes me as extremely odd that they reportedly made female characters in the game less feminine in order to appeal to trans gamers, but Lev isn't treated as a priority. I guess I'm also confused as to why some people seem dead set on defending this game and saying everyone that dislikes it is a bigot when it doesn't even feature good representation. You might say Ellie at least is good representation, but if this Ellie is the only one we got and there is no Last of Us Part 1, no one would care about this person. The scene between Joel and Ellie where Joel finally tells her the truth is way too short. He tells her that he put the entire world at risk to save her and she understandably gets upset, then the scene is over. I got the vibe that I was watching an OVA of an anime rather than the actual anime and if there was ever a time for a 20 minute cinematic in a video game, it was that scene. And I understand that they revisit the issue later, but that conversation is too short as well. Ellie never even asked Joel why he did it. Joel never says it's because you're like a daughter to me, and I love you. He doesn't try to justify his actions by saying, the world is already too far gone. We had no guarantee it would work. What if you had died for nothing? I couldn't lose another daughter. Don't do this to me, babe. Don't do this to me, babe. Come on. If I was making this, I would have had the whole game center around that. Abby and Joel meet up and work together to fight the Scars, with Abby not knowing who Joel is. Perhaps Joel could even be smart and lie about his name to be careful, adding some tension to the situation because we don't know when she'll find out. We get lots of Ellie and Joel, and Joel and Abby. They bond because Joel lost a daughter but found Ellie. Abby lost a father but found Isaac. I mean, imagine the look on Joel's face when Abby tells him the story about this crazy person that killed her dad. Maybe at the midpoint, Abby realizes who Joel is and has a mental breakdown trying to decide what to do. After lots of fighting, you, the player, get to decide what to do with Joel at the end of the game. I also like shorter games, so this shit would be like 15 hours rather than 25. Abby's dad isn't that great either in the few scenes we get with him. He makes a few jokes, then dies. And while I'm thinking about it, it's also very stupid that pregnant Mel is running around like Sam Fisher. 
of pregnant women running around, jumping up, dropping from buildings, shooting guns, lighting up fucking bombs. I like Tommy overall, but it's strange when he's talking to Ellie and says, don't go get revenge. Then he goes to get revenge. It really does feel like there are artifacts from previous storylines that were left in the game because they didn't have time to remove them. I saw someone in a comment say they don't like Tommy in the epilogue and he feels like a different character. The more I think about that, the more I agree. I'll make her pay. Tommy. That's what you said when we got back to Jackson. Tommy. I'm honestly just happy Tommy lived through the game. If they do make a Last of Us Part 3, I would love to play as Tommy, as long as we move on from all this bullshit. This is how you gonna repay me, huh? Repay you? For all those goddamn years I took care of us. Took care? That's what you call it? I got nothing but nightmares from those years. You survived because of me! It wasn't worth it. Neil needs to find Bruce on whatever boat he's on and beg him to come back. Some have been saying, it's got a bad story, but excellent gameplay. But I think there are several ways the gameplay could have been better as well. Several sections are separated by doors where you have to hold triangle to get past them. I played on hard, not survivor because I'm a pansy. And there were lots of times where I got past everyone, only to get spotted because I had to stand in one spot for forever to get through the door. It felt like artificial difficulty and in my opinion, if I'm able to sneak past everyone, I should be free to go at that point. There was also a time when I died, but the game acted like I had beaten the section. This happened to PewDiePie as well. She's planting a bomb. There we go. Finally the... I guess we both die? What just happened? Oh, I did it! <laughs> the AI is strange to me because in wide open spaces, they are great and flank you appropriately, but I was able to kite them to a corner and kill them all one by one when we were in a closed off area. There are also times when they are very oblivious as to what's going on around them. Same can be said for my AI teammates. Joel nuked everything in the flashbacks, but Jesse didn't seem to notice enemies bearing down on us. One feature that reviewers have dick rode endlessly is enemies yell at their friends' names when they die. And to be fair, it is a nice feature. But the idea that I'm supposed to feel sorry for these people when they are sicking dogs on me, saying tear her apart, and shooting at me on sight is dumb. If you're putting me in a position where I have to kill a dog, fuck you. Characters also don't say anything personal when you grab them, and the playable characters don't either. Compare that to the weirdly likable guards in Splinter Cell. I know there were ninjas here! Towards the end of the game, the Rattlers have some infected tied up, and I really like how that added another dimension to clearing the area. But it also got that noggin jogging about Far Cry 3, and the various ways to take down a camp, and Metal Gear Solid 5, which has almost unlimited freedom. It makes me wonder how people can say this is a 10 out of 10, game of the generation, when there are games that clearly all do one aspect of this game better than this game does. I suppose someone could make the bad argument that it's more than the sum of its parts, but I disagree with that since we're constantly jumping around and things feel disconnected as fuck. I also wish they had given us new enemy types that had more intelligence rather than being big and dumb. Some of the best gameplay for me was fighting the stalkers, but they only showed up a few times. I would love it if they had added enemies that could speak using very rudimentary phrases. This could lead characters to debate whether or not part of the person was still alive, continuing the idea that was brought up briefly in the first game. If you want an example of what I'm talking about, they did this with the phantoms in Prey. I really, really, really enjoyed the sniper sequence versus Tommy, although I think it would have been better to play it first as Tommy, pick off a bunch of WLF, and Tommy celebrates and treats it like a happy moment. Then we get it again from WLF perspective, and it's hard as shit. Granted, you would have to make the WLF individuals actually likable, and add more people that Tommy could pick off one by one. <sighs> now that I think about it, the game would be a lot better if there was an option not to kill Owen, male, and Asian girl. It just wasn't obvious. Let's use male as our case study. She doesn't like Abby either, so I consider her a friend. You're a piece of shit, Abby. If I had killed Mel, then found out at the end of the game if I didn't do a certain QTE, or maybe took a different route, or found a note, or not killed some guards, then maybe she could still be alive. I'd feel bad. The more I come up with alternate scenarios, the more depressed I get at what we got. I need something to hype me up. <laughs> I don't understand why Dina tells Ellie they should be terrified of you. In a flashback before Ellie went on a warpath, Druckmann said in an interview that they had trouble deciding where the flashback should go, but his co-writer, Haley, fixed them. I'm sorry, Neil, but she did not fix them. This dude shows his name in the opening like he's Hideo Kojima. Imagine Kojima being like, I couldn't decide where to put these scenes, so I had someone else do it. Moving on from that, I was watching PewDiePie's live stream, and when Abby was talking to the Firefly on the radio, people were saying that it sounded like Tommy, and it would have been so amazing 
that Abby went to meet with them. Happy music plays like at the quote-unquote end of Red Dead Redemption 1. Then Tommy pops up and shoots her 95 times. He was a firefly at some point, so it does make sense that he would have the frequency. Or he could just find it. The program does have a new game plus mode, and I started a new game on Survivor Plus, but it got bored really quickly. The first time through, I was more forgiving of all the walking, but once you already know the story, it's pretty mundane. Puzzles are very simplistic and make the witness seem like it should be in a museum. And no, I didn't complete the witness. I'm way too retarded. Returning to this game, Jeremy Johns had a very interesting perspective I didn't consider. Whereas Ellie's story is much more linear going from point A to point B, Abby's story is the story that actually takes me around and lets me see more of this world I so enjoy. Which I feel like there might have been some skillful manipulation right there. In order to have you accept this new character and want to play as Abby. But even if that's what they were doing, it clearly wasn't enough. I would however like to take a minute to appreciate the game's graphics that made my base PS4 sound like it was trying to escape itself and the inclusion of a guitar that you can play real songs on. But I do feel like more time was spent on this window dressing than the actual core story. This is a nitpick for sure, but I find it weird that the lesbian sex was skipped, but the heterosexual sex that I don't think a single person wanted to see was not. I'm not sure if the term anti-porn already exists, but I would like to coin it for this particular scene. This shit makes me want to just never be around another human again. Oh my God, what is this? It also made me dislike Abby more, which I didn't think was possible, because she fucked a dude with a pregnant partner who she hung out with during the game. In conclusion, Last of Us Part 2 has a horrible story, forgettable characters, and okay gameplay. After the game was released, the reviews became much more critical, with almost every single one from a non-mainstream outlet shitting on it. I'll give it a 1 out of 10 for the simple fact that, I was, that it ran. Many people compared it to Game of Thrones Season 8, which is an apt comparison, considering Drugman has said he's a fan of David Benioff's novel, City of Thieves. As one would expect, Neil knocked down the straw man of the misinformation out there about the game, but didn't address any real problems. The user score was around a 3.4, then Metacritic started deleting bad reviews, leading it to proudly rise up to a 4.4. As of recording, it's at like a 4.9 right now. Someone posted that Death Stranding, Kojima's newest game, was boring as shit on Facebook and they sold it for The Last of Us Part 2. Kojima Productions' official Facebook replied, The choice of game reflects the quality of the player. Maybe it suits you more. P.S. Also the choice of words. And screenshotted the user score. I'm not sure if Hideo himself is operating the page, but even if it's not him, it's still funny, and Kojima certainly hasn't disavowed it. This exchange led people to bring up an old clip where Neil Druckmann said certain female characters were harmful to young girls because they were overly sexualized. To prove his point, Neil used Quiet from Metal Gear Solid 5, a chick who I don't recognize, I, I swear I don't, and Cortana from Halo. Because when I think of sexy video game characters, I think of Cortana. I wonder if it ever occurred to Neil that a lady could be well-written and attractive and you don't have to pick one or the other. Also, can you imagine being Neil's wife and watching him, like, rag on women for being attractive? I mean, how would you feel? I personally think it could be harmful to turn beauty into a negative trait, and it should be said that these are video game characters. No one should look at an animated thing and get sad they don't look like that. In some cases, it's pretty much impossible. Next thing, Druckmann inserted himself into the game at least once, maybe twice. The first being a trading card that is clearly him, the second being the fact that he and Manny look quite similar, which makes him writing Manny as a ladies' man pretty funny. Look at it! Look at That's Neil, dude! Neil just straight spit on Joel! There were also rumors that Neil actually mo capped the anti-porn scene that I mentioned earlier, but that doesn't appear to be true. And of course, there's currently a change.org petition to rewrite the game, and I'm sure that will happen. It's also, also worth noting that The Last of Us Part 2 dropped 80% in box sales in the UK during its second week. For comparison, Uncharted 4 dropped 78%, Spider-Man 42%, and God of War 35%. On June 28th, Jason tweeted out kind of a meme that games were too long. Troy Baker, the voice actor for Joel, responded with a lengthy Roosevelt quote. And he says this. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done better. 
The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory or death. Some people took Troy's side, others like YouTuber Joseph Anderson and this random Twitter man made fun of Troy, calling him insecure, and that's where I stand on it. Almost all mainstream coverage of the game has been positive, and Neil and Troy need to relax. I should also say that this isn't the first time Troy has acted like this, and I only gave Uncharted 4 a 4 out of 10, and Troy co-signed a petition to have his review removed from Metacritic and people told him to get over it then too. Then on June 30th, Polygon published an article revealing that Sony representatives, on behalf of Naughty Dog, had contacted Vice over their negative review of The Last of Us Part 2. They felt some of the conclusions I reached in my review were unfair and dismissed some meaningful changes or improvements, said the reviewer. He went on to say that while the messages weren't confrontational, it was unusual. Just to reiterate, Almost every review from a mainstream outlet was positive, except for Vice. And when it wasn't positive, Sony, on behalf of Naughty Dog, contacted the reviewer. Sony, a billion dollar company, contacting a reviewer over a negative score is completely fucked. My head's about to explode. Let's move on to the conspiracy theory. As salty as I am at Naughty Dog and Sony, keep in mind this is a theory, not a statement of fact, because I don't want Sony in my DMs. In The Last of Us Part 2, written and directed by Neil Druckmann, two protagonists from the first game are cast in an antagonistic light. Another game where this occurs is the third game in the Legacy of Cain series, Soul Reaver 2, written and directed by Amy Hennig, Neil's co-worker who left under curious circumstances. Let's compare them, but keep in mind, I have not played the Legacy of Cain series. I just read up on it. Here are the broad strokes. In The Last of Us Part 1, Joel is the protagonist. In the first Legacy of Kane game, Kane is the protagonist. I know that's surprising. In The Last of Us Part 2, for part of the game, you play as Abby, who wants revenge on Joel. In Soul Reaver 2, you play as Raziel, who wants revenge on Kane. In Part 2, Abby goes after Ellie, but gives up on it at a certain point. In Soul Reaver 2, Raziel goes after Kane, but gives up on it as well. In Part 2, Ellie, a protagonist from the first game, cuts Abby down, saving her, then lets her go realizing that the cycle of violence will continue if she doesn't. In Soul Reaver 2, Raziel realizes that because of the cycle of destiny, he's basically fucked. Then Kane, the protagonist from the first game, saves him. And that's how it ends. So, in my opinion, I think the broad strokes of these two games are kind of almost the same. To play devil's advocate, there's also a lot that's different in the games as well. And this isn't enough to definitively say Neil copied Amy. Because if it was a direct copy, Abby never would have actually killed Joel. But the reason why I think it's still worth calling attention to is the rumor that Amy, the BAFTA winner that wrote Soul Reaver 2, was forced out of Naughty Dog. I mean, if the theory is true, Neil would have worked for Amy, then stole her outline for Uncharted 4, forced her out of the company, then stole her outline for Last of Us Part 2. And when you factor in Amy's departure from Naughty Dog and the fact that Joe Carnahan is under the impression that Neil is shady, it becomes a lot more weird. It's also funny to me that several YouTubers have made the comment that The Last of Us Part 2 should be the third game in the series, when Soul Reaver 2 is the third game in the series and gives you an entire game to get used to Raziel. And that's exactly what people have been saying Neil should have done with Abby. Even if Neil is completely innocent, which I really want to stress, he very well could be, it makes me wonder what could have been if Amy had written The Last of Us Part 2. If you play the Legacy of Kane series, please let me know what you think of the theory. I really do want to know. My channel has become a bit too negative recently, so my next video will be Dick Riding Attack on Titan, and I'll see you then. Well, this place takes me back. How so? It was right after everything went down. I ended up in a triage just like this. And everywhere you looked, you just saw families torn apart. The whole damn world seemed to have turned upside down in the blank. Is that after you lost Sarah? Yes, it was. I can't imagine losing someone you love like that. Losing everything that you know. I'm sorry, Joel. 
That's okay, Ellie. Hey, Joel, I got something for you. Here. Maria showed this to me and I, uh, I stole it. I hope you don't mind. you try I guess you can't escape your past <laughs> thank you 